You might be saying to yourself, hey, you know, this guy talks a lot about love. Well, I feel like I'm a pretty loving person. You know, I, I try to do the best I can and I, I treat people well, right? So, why is this guy taking everything so seriously? Yeah. Well, you can have that view, totally. You know, it's your free will to have that view. But everything that everyone does has huge ripple effects that go out and we choose not to be aware of those ripple effects, okay? If everything is going so great, no need to question our views, right? But are we really happy with this place? Are you having fun? You know, I ask that to people. Are you having fun in life? And most people say no. So, you know, my view, my understanding of how the soul works is that our imaginations and our pleasurable feelings like joy, bliss, and pleasure are stifled and hindered when we suppress our own emotions, okay? And therefore, I feel it is valuable and useful and necessary challenge some of society's mundane norms, okay? So, we'll go through this, and then I'll provide some examples or suggestions of different behavior, okay? How about football? It is definitely the most popular sport in the United States. And it's arguably the most violent. You could say like mixed martial arts is more violent or boxing might be more violent. But, you know, this is, this is happening on a very large scale where there's 55 men on a team. It's, it's brutal war games. Now, I used to love football. I have bonded with friends over football. I have played fantasy football. I have played football video games. I have gambled on football. I played football myself. It's incredibly violent and brutal. And oftentimes the people that play it for any sustained period of time suffer significant, significant physical injuries. How about CTE? There's brain problems. The people kill themselves, right? That's just what you hear about. What about the guy who played linebacker for Alabama back in 83 that uh, didn't make the NFL? What's happened to him? You think he's doing good right now? I don't know. Probably not, right? What does it say about us as Americans that our, our most popular game is so brutal and violent? I think it says that we've got a lot of anger and brutality inside of us and that we enjoy violence and brutality. We like it. We don't want to admit it to ourselves. But this gets back to being honest. If you like watching football, be honest with yourself. I like watching men beat the shit out of other men. It also creates a weird jingoism, right? Like, my team is better than your team, right? I'm from the Philadelphia area. People from the Philadelphia area hate Dallas people because of a football rivalry. How about Boston or New York? Are you playing in the game? Do you own the team? Do you work for the team? Well then, if not, it's not your team. You are an observer, not a participant. And that's a big difference. And then, and then people let the outcomes of these contests affect how they treat other people in their life. Right? When I was growing up, it was very obvious if the Eagles lose on Sunday, Monday, everyone's in a terrible mood. Is that loving behavior? How about the ads you watch while you watch football? 
Coca-Cola, which is essentially a plastic company. How about alcohol? Right? It's poison. What about like um, pizza, which is potentially one of the worst foods you can actually eat? Chicken wings. These things are horrible for you. And you know what? If you actually wanted to be an athlete, you wouldn't be eating that stuff. And then people sit and, and observe and then critique on a game they could never play in their entire life. Hmm. And, then, and then they get attached to their own opinions about that and then fight other people about that. Like, how about these publicly funded stadium scams that go on, okay? Where, you know, some of the richest people in the country own these football franchises. And they go to politicians and they say, if you don't give me several hundred million dollars out of the public fund, I'm going to move the team because I don't give a fuck about your city. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have to answer to all these rabid jingoist fans that live in your city. You know, I have a friend who's a special education teacher in Philadelphia. She has to pay for her own school supplies. That's, that's, that shows where our priorities are at. Violence, that's our priority. How about animals? Do you have a pet? A dog or a cat? Dogs and cats are great. They, they're, they show affection and you can train them and you can go on adventures with them and you can snuggle with them and you can, you can have all kinds of great experiences with them, right? And oftentimes, you know, there's some Asian cultures that will actually eat dogs and cats. And we Americans love to judge that. <laughs> That's disgusting. How, how could they do that? And yet, You'll eat other animals, right? You'll eat cows and pigs and goats, right? Sheep, chickens. These animals have awareness. They have an emotional state. They're not humans and they don't have human souls, but they have spirit bodies. So like they feel. And I would encourage you to watch the documentary called Earthlings if you would like to in induce an emotional experience related to humans' treatment of animals. And how about like when you go to the grocery store and you buy some animal carcass, it's all wrapped up for you and nice and neat. And it, you know, they, they call it a steak, right? Because we don't want to call it what it is, which is animal carcass, okay? It separates you from the truth of what it is. If you were being honest with yourself, you would slaughter the cow yourself. Would you want to do that? Would you want to cut that animal's throat? Would you want to look that animal in the eye and cut its throat? But yet you have no, no trouble having other people do it. It's ignorance. How about how we dispose of our waste? You know, in the United States, our toilets use more water than other countries around the world because it's comfortable for us. And how about like, you know, just even the act of sitting on a toilet. Sitting on a toilet is not the optimal way to release fecal matter. The optimal way to release solid waste out of the human body is to squat. And this is done all over the world. The interesting thing is, if you look around at some, a lot of Americans were either too frail or too immobile or out of shape to even squat. What would you do if you had to go to the bathroom and there was no toilet? I think a lot of people would have a lot of problems. And then rather than use like, like a bidet or like a little water wand or something to clean us up, we cut down trees to make toilet paper and waste, waste resources. Why? 
because it makes us because we're comfortable doing it and we don't want to question and we don't want to we don't want to talk about these things because it's icky why are you talk why are you talking about pooping you know why does it make you uncomfortable it's a normal human function you know part of the reason why young people enjoy potty humor so much is because it makes adults uncomfortable because <laughs> they've got their own hang-ups about it okay now I had the pleasure of visiting Africa and when I was in South Africa I went on uh, some safari and I, pff, which was awesome I'm so fortunate to be able to have done that you know I wanted to see all the animals before they're not there anymore I had an excellent ranger who was very knowledgeable and forthcoming with information, very enthusiastic. And, you know, like, we're driving around and I'm, I'm asking him questions, what's this, what's that? And we're seeing these big, round mounds everywhere. And I'm like, what are those, what are those mounds? And he's like, oh, that's elephant dung. I'm like, huh. And he told me a story that, like, you know, as part of the ranger initiation, you got to go out and do all kinds of weird stuff, you know, with the animals. And one of the things that he had to do was roll around in the elephant shit. And he said something really interesting. He said, you know, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> it was actually quite nice because it smells very floral. And he, we talked about the elephant diet, that elephants eat leaves and tree bark. And then when we were looking at the elephant dung, you would see it surrounded with life. That there were dung beetles rolling up their eggs in a big, you know, elephant dung ball. And that there were all these really neat insects flying around and laying their eggs in there. But beautiful butterflies making their home in the elephant dung. In contrast, he pointed out the lion dung. How it was watery and didn't hold shape how it was full of bacteria and yet no other or life organism would go near it. What do the lions eat? Carcass, flesh. Interesting. We'll come back to this in a second, okay? How about grass? You know, people love their lawns and their green grass. It's, how about, how about like the stereotype of like the middle class fancy dad that, you know, throws on his white New Balances and gets out there and rides his tractor on a Sunday and keeps his lawn nice and crisp. It is a monoculture that we spray carcinogenic chemicals on and use carbon burning machines to maintain. It doesn't serve us at all, other than someone's pride about having a green yard. Where did, where did this come from? Because in the, you know, I live in the, uh, I live in the coastal plain of North Carolina. So like, you know, the entire eastern United States should be hardwood forests. And yet, everywhere you look, all I see is grass. Well, part of that is because the colonists who felt they needed to separate from England wanted their stately manners to look like the royalty of England. What a lack of imagination. You're trying to separate from the tyranny and rule of England, and yet you want to model your home exactly how they modeled their home? Hmm. Now, where I live, grass doesn't grow at all. But that doesn't stop people from trying. In fact, there's a sod farm right down the street from me. And people go and they waste their money, and they put the sod down, and then they spray the poison water that's full of perfluorinated compounds here in Wilmington, and then they watch it die. And then they do it all again next year. 
You know, there is, there are natural grasses in the United States. They're supposed to be on the Great Plains and in the Midwest. Okay. And they're meant to be consumed by large grazing animals. Well, there's no more large grazing animals because we killed them all. Ironically, the large grazing animals that now exist are trapped in factory farms and force-fed hay. And yet, we have grass growing everywhere. Sad. Also, it's worth noting that the types of grass that people use for their lawns in eastern North Carolina was brought here via Bermuda and Africa from the slave trade. So the centipede and the Kentucky bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass doesn't come from Kentucky, it comes from Bermuda and Africa. So, you know, your green lawn is actually a, a, an old vestige of the slave trade. Do I have grass on my property? No, I don't. Well, what's on my property then? We'll come back to that. How about clothing? You know, the fashion industry is the second largest user and waster of water. And, and, and polluter too, you know. I challenge you to go grab an article of clothing and see where it was made. Let's say it's made in Bangladesh. Google Bangladesh pollution and take a look at that. Do you wear Nike products? Nike products are made from slave labor in China. Why not build paradise? Because it's not possible. Maybe it's not possible to you because your imagination is weak. Because we have suppressed emotions inside of us. And we can't even conceive what is not. This is when we get trapped in our intellect. That we can only compare and contrast known things. And the imagination is everything else that has yet to be. Or that we just have not experienced. Because it could have been in the, in the past but we don't know it. We humans build our societies on scarcity principles. There's enough for everybody here, but we hoard. The families that run the banking system, they trickle down a little bit, a little bit. Just enough to keep everyone alive and working for, in the ways that they want you to work. Did the creator make you and put you here so that you can work in an office and have a, have a, a green lawn? No. No. The creator operates in abundance principles, okay? Consider a tomato plant. A consider a tomato. A tomato has, first of all, tomatoes are delicious. If you get organic heirloom tomatoes, because like the other tomatoes that you get in the grocery store, I don't even know what you call them. I don't even waste my time with them. They're not tomatoes. Get your tomatoes from a local farmer or grow them yourself. But you crack open a tomato, it's got hundreds of seeds in it. Each one of those seeds has the potential to produce hundreds, sometimes thousands of fruits. Thousands of fruits? Yeah, look up George Wilbur, okay? He had the Guinness Book of World Records, I think back in the eight, like 89 or whatever. He got 1,200 pounds of fruit off of one cherry tomato plant. That's abundance. Each one of those fruits has seeds which can produce its own plants, which can produce hundreds or thousands of even more fruits. 
How about that patch of city grass out there that's got nothing on it? Wouldn't it be neato if there was a nectarine tree there? How about a jabutacaba tree? Do you even know what that is? Look it up. There are all kinds of foods that exist that we do not have access to for various reasons. Something doesn't ship well, where you can't, you know, it, 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 you pick it and, it, and it, uh, you gotta eat it right away, right? But if we had stuff growing everywhere, we could all be enjoying in the splendor of the joyous experience of eating clean, delicious food. Potentially, every time we eat, we could kind of get high. Well, you might say to yourself, Okay, that sounds like a good idea, but like, what, you know, if I just dig a hole in my grass and put a nectarine tree there, it's going to die. Or, or it'll take forever for it to produce a fruit. Well, instead of grass, we could be building soil. How do you build soil? Well, I don't have grass on my property anymore. I have covered my grass with two feet of wood chips and other organic material. In an effort to build a microbiome, and create fresh organic topsoil from scratch in an attempt to grow my own food, to take responsibility for myself, and to engage in joy, you know? You eat things that you grow, it's, it's a joyous experience. Let's come back to this here, okay? If every human in this place was a plant-based person, we could use our sewage as fertilizer for the plant kingdom. Now things would grow quickly, right? Have you even thought about that? If you're a human and you're eating an optimal diet, you're going to produce high quality waste. I mean, we use cow manure as fertilizer. Why couldn't we use human manure? Because we eat animal products, that's why. And because we drug ourselves. You know, they did a study in Seattle a couple years ago. They found that the, uh, the treated water, post water treatment center, full of heroin from all the opiates that people were taking. So our, our waste doesn't even help anything grow. That's sad. This place could be awesome. But we don't want to question our norms. These are just a few examples. You know, I challenge you to question everything. This stuff is the way it is because people are benefiting off of it. Let's go back to football. You know, football requires a tremendous amount of resources to play. If, if it's just you and three other friends, can you go out and play football? No. You can play some bastardized version of it, but you need at least 22 people. You need drawn up plays. You need um, all kinds of equipment. You need a specific field. You need a giant goalpost. You need all this crap. What about inventing new games that have yet to be, right? Maybe if we each were less spectators and more participants, then our public funds wouldn't get raided by billionaires building giant monuments to themselves. Are you feeling uncomfortable? That's okay. I encourage you to own your own emotions and investigate some of these, right? Because it's not like, like if you agree with me about football, it's not like you can't just say to yourself, I'm gonna stop watching football. You actually have to feel out your, your pleasure for watching violence. If you admit that to yourself, and you release your anger, okay? 
you will not be interested in watching football anymore. <laughs> That's how it works, okay? You're not gonna miss it because when you fix, when you heal the emotion that creates the enjoyment for it, you'll no longer feel enjoyment for this and you'll feel more enjoy, you'll, like, you'll be looking at a tree and you'll just feel joy and bliss. That's, I mean, you know, that's awesome. Who has more power? The person who needs to watch a football game to feel pleasure or the person who can just go out and sit in the outside and enjoy themselves? The person who can enjoy themselves with less stuff needs to work less. Doesn't need to participate in these non-loving systems. So, I probably talked for long enough on this. Good luck, love and peace, friends.